All right, so we have an awesome guest lecturer today. Thank you, Dr. D'Onofrio, for coming. Um, Dr. D'Onofrio is a professor and chair of the Department of Emergency Medicine at Yale University and physician in chief of the emergency services at Yale New Haven Hospital. She's internationally known for her work in mentoring physician scientists in developing independent research careers. Uh, for the past 28 years, she has developed and tested interventions for alcohol, opioids, and other substance use disorders, serving as PI on several large NIH, uh, SAMHSA, and CDC studies that have changed clinical practice. She's currently the PI on two uh, NIDA clinical trial network grants. The recently funded ED innovation tests the implementation of ED-initiated buprenorphine in 30 diverse EDs across the country and compares different formulations of buprenorphine and engaging patients in treatment. Dr. Tanafrio is the PI of, the, of a NIDA-funded K-12 establishing the Yale Drug Use Addiction and HIV Research Scholars Program, a three-year postdoctoral interdisciplinary mentored career development program with focused training in prevention and treatment of drug use, addiction, and HIV in general medical settings. She is founding board members. Uh, she is she is a founding board member of Addiction Medicine, now recognized as a new specialty subspecialty by the ABMS. Um, and I'll hand it over to you now, so you're good to go. Okay, great. Can can you hear me fine? <laughs> we can hear you great. Okay, good. All right. So anyway, I have a lot to talk about today um, around ED initiated buprenorphine for opiate use disorder. And um, hopefully um, you are all learning how to do this before you leave because it is a critical function. It's really not optional. So um, I'm here to just start your process in it. And I certainly can help you if you aren't doing this, um, how to get started. So I have some how-to slides. Um, these are my disclosures. I'm really funded by a lot of agencies um, uh, that are federal and I don't have any other disclosure. So, um, right off, what do we know? Um, we know the extent of the problem. So from the National Survey on Drug Use and Health, which comes out every year in um, September, our most recent results were last September that are the always the year before, 20.4 million Americans greater than 12 years of age have a substance use disorder, 1.6 million have an opiate use disorder, and almost 10 million report non-medical use of pain relievers in the past year. Um, so the evolution of drivers of overdose deaths in all ages really started with analgesics, as you know, uh, and pills um, moved quickly to heroin, moved quickly then to synthetic um, opioids such as fentanyl. And now we are adding stimulants and many of the deaths are combination of the stimulants with opioids. So um, there in 2019, there were 70,000 overall deaths um, for overdose. 50,000 of those were from opioids, whether they were prescription or illicit. And you can see in this diagram here how those synthetic opiates are really, which are driven primarily by fentanyl are going up. And these stimulants are going up just as much. Um, and there's less use of heroin and, and less um, use of deaths of um, natural and semi-synthetics like you know, oxycodone. Um, it's predicted um, by the CDC that in the 12 months ending August 2020, that there will be 88,000 overall deaths. Um, these have to be vetted all the time between the states till they finally come out with those numbers. If you go on their website, you can kind of see what they're predicting. Um, and that will be a 26% increase. I always think it's important that you understand that there are faces besides all these deaths, and these are not just statistics. Um, and that recent data, as I told you, um, show that 223 people lose their lives every single day uh, from opioids. And these are somebody's family, whether it's your sister, your, your mother, your brother, your spouse, your significant other, um, they really do have um, faces and they unfortunately um, die often very young. We know that treatment works. Um, I don't need to sit here and tell you a lot about the evidence for opiate agonist treatment. I only talked to you about how we um, use the venue of the ED, um, but there's, there's gobs and gobs of research around this. Um, if you look at the Cochrane reviews, um, 
The most famous is Matic in 2014 that showed that methadone opiate agonists such as methadone and buprenorphine were equally effective. There are 31 trials and almost 5,500 participants. They decrease opiate use and increase patients in um, retention of treatment. Other um, Cochrane reviews came out that show that that adding psychosocial support doesn't change the effectiveness of retention and treatment in open use disorder. It may, why it may be good in some aspects, it is not the treatment. The treatment is the medication, just like diabetes, the treatment is insulin or um, types of, of um, other types of oral medications. Um, it certainly involves behavioral interventions, but the treatment is the medication. We know that opiate agonist treatment, and this has thousands of papers in, into it. If you like, I can send you those thousands of papers, but it causes a reduction in illicit opiate use. There's less viral transmission, so there's less hepatitis, HIV, and other um, intravenous drug use complications. There's a reduction in overdose deaths. There's a reduction in risky behaviors like se unwanted sexual activity, um, reduction in risks of legal consequences, and thus more time available for individuals to have sustainable relationships, find gainful employment, and deal with other medical problems that they might have. There is probably nothing more um, gratifying to treat someone um, who has overdosed or is um, really in the depths of despair and then see them and a month or so later anywhere being totally functional. The um, National Academy of Medicine um, put out this consensus report in 2019 um, that showed that medications for obese disorder save lives. And um, on the right-hand side, this was sponsored by NIDA and SAMHSA, um, basically is the taking these hundreds of pages and distilling them into a few thoughts. OED is treatable. Um, we have FDA-approved medications. Long-term retention is associated with improved outcomes. A lack of availability of behavioral interventions is not justification for withholding medications. Most people could benefit, but don't receive it, and access is quite inequitable. Withholding or failing to have available or all classes of, of approved medications in care or justice setting is denying appropriate medical treatment. And confronting the major barriers to use is critical to addressing the opiate crisis, and that's really what I'm here today for, is to um, spread this word of you know, what's going on with you and why aren't we doing it? We also know that the ED offers 24 7, 365 option to combat the opiate crisis. Why focus on the ED? Because that's where the patients are. This is the low barrier access to many, and they're often there for other reasons, not necessarily seeking treatment, but there for other complications. Approximately one in every 80 visits are opiate related. It costs $5 billion a year. You can find those patients easily. Um, they're from overdose, they're seeking treatment, or you can do it from screening or just getting more information as you talk to your patients. Right now, these two epidemics or a pandemic colliding with the opioid epidemic has caused huge um, crises and escalated the problems. This is a recent article from JAMA Psychiatry. Um, it's from uh, different uh, people from the CDC. And uh, what you can see on the left-hand side, there are counts of ED visits from December 2018 through to last October. And you can see though that we had a massive increase in mental health conditions, all overdoses and over opiate overdoses as well. And then if you look at this right-hand side of the slide, what you see is the weekly changes and visits compared to this. So these gray lines going down show you that we markably went down. Most EDs around the country went down to about 40% um, reductions in these areas uh, and these months here. And while we have increased our, our visits, you can see that we're still down overall. I can tell you um, through working with all the chairs around the country, we're all about 15% down in our um, patient population. This should be of great interest to you because as graduation comes, there are many of you who are not gonna find jobs. Um, and that's because in many sites, they've cut back on um, emergency physicians, thinking that that's because these, these rates have come down. Unfortunately, as we all know, the severity of our visits have gone up. And I can tell you that one of those huge things that have happened is the opiate overdoses, which are represented in red and all overdoses, the percent change 
in, um, in green. So there's lots of reasons um, to be trying to take care of patients like this. We also know the consequences of inaction. This is one of my favorite articles because um, Mark La Rochelle really was able to show the world what was so important about EDs and how they could um, treat patients. Um, this was a study from Massachusetts where they really um, were able to combine many data sets throughout the state. They're one of the few states that have that ability to do that. They looked at um, almost 18,000 patients between 2012 and 2014. All of these patients went to an emergency department for a non-fatal opiate overdose. What they found was really um, shocking. Um, the fact is that if nothing is done, 5% of those patients will be dead in, in 12 months. There is nothing else that causes that, not even, even just approaching what would happen with someone who comes in with an acute STEMI. Um, there is nothing else that causes a one-year mortality rate of 5%. Um, we also found that only 30% of them ever received medications once they left the ED or in that 12 months, not just from EDs, but from anywhere in the healthcare system. And so if they received nothing, they had a 5% rate. If they received opiate agonists, which are buprenorphine or a methadone maintenance treatment, it was um, significantly more than 50, almost 60% reduction in um, overall deaths there was no reduction in naltrexone. Another study, same kind of system. This is from Massachusetts. Again, um, a little bit different years. They looked at mortality for non-fatal overdose from 11 to 2015, but very similar results, 5% are dead in a year. But what um, Scott Weiner was able to show that many of these die within the first month. These are the patients uh, 30 days out of their ED visit and a substantial amount of them die within two days. So you do have an opportunity there to um, intervene. We also know the evidence. This was uh, my study in 2015, which at the time was pretty novel. We would start and initiate uh, buprenorphine use uh, immediately in the emergency department. 50% of these patients, by the way, were starting with home or unobserved induction. Um, and 50% I started in the emergency department. They were randomized into three groups. And in these groups, the referral group was not your normal referral group. We had people who gave them, based on their insurance and preference, an exact place to go. These patients in the middle group had a brief intervention, motivating them to seek treatment and were actively facilitated a referral. And I thought this was gonna be just as good as this, to be honest, when I started. And the buprenorphine group, which got the intervention, but also received um, the medication of prescription or, and, and follow up with our primary care center for um, 10 more weeks of treatment. And you can see that was overwhelmingly that 80% of people were in treatment at 30 days who were in the buprenorphine group. These were not bad. This is not, no, hardly anybody does this anyway, but the overwhelming amount was here. We also found that they were had less um, illicit opiate use for the week before at seven day visit as well. And one of my colleagues from the School of Public Health here was able to show that it was very cost effective to initiate this. And these are complicated acceptability curves, but basically what they show you is that for every willingness, dollar willingness to pay, that, that, that um, treatment engagement probably of cost effectiveness for treatment engagement was way higher for view. And for every day um, free of opiates, for every dollar willing to pay, buprenorphine was much less likely to um, have patients who were free of opiates for a day. So that was um, pretty exciting to also see that. Uh, this is a paper we recently just published um, in JAMA Open, which actually looked at the National Ambulatory um, health survey uh, data, and we looked at trends in the use of buprenorphine, and you can see that um, when buprenorphine was first started and able to be given out by the DEA back here in 2002, um, we have increased substantially during that period of time. I'd like to say this is when the first articles came out, 2015, people started using it, but we certainly have a lot more to go. Um, than where we are right now, but threefold change, which is decent. 
Um, I want to direct you to some other um, evidence. This was a um, medication assisted treatment in EDs. I hate that word. We tried to get SAMHSA to change it. We were held hostage to the last administration and there's a lot wrong with this booklet that we created, but um, it has, has some really nice things in it and uh, we hope to update it um, shortly. But this issue, um, you can download this, it's free, gives you a lot of the data and a lot of addressing the myths and other, and it really shows you about, highlights four or five programs that have been able to do this. Um, the reason we don't like it is because it assumes that it's an assisted treatment. It's not an assisted treatment, it is the treatment. Um, and so we have replaced that with medications for opiate use disorder. And we hope um, why they originally said they would do that at the last minute, um, they reneged on that goal. Um, EDs and emergent physicians can identify patients with opiate use disorder. They can provide treatment. That means not just initiating buprenorphine or offering buprenorphine, not everyone will take it, but they'll know that you have access. It's also regarding overdose education and naloxone distribution. We know that prescriptions really do not work. Um, you should work with your local health departments to get you um, actual um, Narcan so that you can give that out with the patients. And it, you need to directly link patients to continue it open to Agnes therapy and preventive services. So all of this latest research shows that we really should do something about this research. And so um, what we learned from doing some implementation science projects, this was a large funded project from NIDA, um, of which we did what's called a hybrid three um, effectiveness implementation study. A hybrid three um, emphasizes implementation, um, but collects I mean, information about effectiveness. The opposite of a hybrid one, which is um, emphasizing effectiveness and collects implementation products as well. And then a hybrid two is a combination equally. So we did this dual testing thing where we wanted to do an implementation strategy and gather information on the impact on clinical outcomes. Um, and we did it in four sites, as you can see here around the US. Um, we use something called implementation facilitation. And the importance of this is just that you know that there are these components and we found out what was really important that could help people and what wasn't. Um, but we had the most important things are having local champions, um, stakeholder engagement and making sure that everybody is involved. Uh, we tailored programs to sites, so specific needs. We gave a lot of academic detailing and I can share with you all of our academic detailing sheets. The most important thing we found was performance monitoring and feedback. You do this all the time. You do it a lot for your STEMIs. Um, you're required to do things like that when you probably see at most 10 a month. Um, whereas here you see 10 in a day um, and we don't do a lot of monitoring. And the nice thing about this feedback is, is feedback, not just like that you didn't do something, but feedback of how great it is. Because the best thing is you only see things um, and patients that do poorly. You don't see all the fabulous um, successes. So we um, often have our, our counselors and our, and anytime I can find this out, um, we make sure that the people who are taking care of that patient get feedback to know that, that their individual was in treatment and they have continued to be in treatment. And it's really um, gratifying um, when that happens and that motivates people to continue um, to work. We also do lear learning collaboratives and these were shared opportunities that people that can get on a web webinar um, and we did them once a month so people from all over those sites could get on, tell us their experiences with their pharmacists, with their counselors, with their medical directors, whoever and learn from each other and sites learned from each other, which was really helpful. And that's one great thing about Zoom. Um, there's a lot <laughs> as we can see, but uh, there's one great thing is that we can do this all over the country. Um, and so I wanted to tell you about another project that was another CTN site. This one project connected, this is pretty much the same thing that we were doing but did it with um, rural and urban settings with high needs and limited resources. And primarily a lot of these patients came from Catholic Medical Center in Manchester, New Hampshire, and Valley Regional Hospital in New Hampshire. And then it also some in Bellevue. But these first two New Hampshire sites are using like contract groups. It's so very difficult to do anything there. So we were just trying to get a project going. 
And we were able to do that project and we had 83% unique ED bup candidates received buprenorphine from 50 ED providers, which was amazing. And then we don't really have a lot of RAs out there. We only had them for a brief period of time. But during that time, we were of the 50 people we could actually enroll in a study because someone can do consent and we can follow them up. 50% um, of them were engaged at 30 days and 70% had at least one visit. And um, there was a lot of decrease in opiate use and fewer, four times fewer opiate overdoses, which was pretty significant. So we published some of this information about barriers and facilitators to clinician readiness to provide. Some of that is the lack of training um, and experience and receive, having to receive the X waiver ability to link to treatment. Although I'll tell you every single city I've been in the entire US and trust me, I've been too many, I have found places. So when people say we don't have any, that's totally not true. Uh, it might be one area in um, that I tried to get in South Dakota somebody, but I found them a place that was an hour away that needed it for a patient and that worked for them. Um, and there's, we know there's competing resources, but these people remember, well, 5% of them will be dead if you do nothing. Um, there's also a lot of misunderstanding and stigma towards patients and we really have to work on that. And so our trainings and our protocol development and, and really feasibility and getting it into the EHRs, ours all integrated into our EHR takes about three clicks and then providing targeted feedback were the things that were most important. So anyone can treat withdrawal. That's pretty easy as there's a 72 hour rule right now from the um, um, FDA where you can just, on um, the DEA rather, that you can allow you to administer um, buprenorphine or any, anything, you could actually administer uh, methadone as well for the purpose of relieving acute withdrawal symptoms while arranging follow-up. Problem with that is you person can't be given a prescription for buprenorphine because um, you don't have an X waiver. So the person would have to come back for three days to the hospital and you would have to administer that. There should be really no reason to do that because some you should have some people who are wavered. Everyone should be wavered. You shouldn't finish a residency without being wavered. Um, but you, um, if you don't, this is something that you could at least administer a dose, hopefully, and then someone else can, um, can write that prescription. With, with COVID, the great thing is that people don't have to have face-to-face -face meetings, which they did before. You have to write a lot in the chart. Now people can just say that um, they reviewed the chart and they are prescribing. So that's much easier to do. We were hoping um, on January 14th that the Trump administration um, at the last minute had come out with abolishing the waiver um, and the DE registration number. And we were hoping that that would be the case. Unfortunately, they took that away um, very quickly. And uh, right now we are in the process of trying to um, fix that and X that X waiver. It doesn't mean that um, the training goes away because you need to know something a lot about this medication. It's not just about treating patients and initiating treatments, but you need to know a lot about buprenorphine because so many people are on it. When they come to you um, with major trauma or some kind of pain, you need to have to know how to treat their pain because it's not going to be that easy why they're on um, buprenorphine, um, which really is a very high affinity mu recept uh, receptor medication and will block everything else off of it, which is why it works. Um, some of the patient's themes that we learned about was that um, patients needed this low barrier access to care and particularly after overdose. Um, there was a sense, and these were patient focus groups from all those different sites that um, ED staff did not understand addiction or perceive it as a medical disease. The perception that pain and medical issues were minimized or not taken seriously because of their history. The history of feeling stigmatized while receiving ED care with recent variability noted across EDs because some more recent patients um, were saying that we were better, that we, we, we certainly improved and rare positive experiences um, with clinicians. And so 
uh, we're part of the problem and we need to make sure that we um, help that ASEP convened a group last year in 2020, January, just before COVID of lots of stakeholders and emergency physicians just dealing with um, the process of stigma and how we could fix it. Part of that is changing our language around addiction. And this was really um, written quite a ways uh, several years ago in JAMA, but we have to know that words do matter, particularly when those words come out of, patient, of physicians and professionals mouths. We have a duty to use language that actually reflects the science, promotes evidence-based treatment and demonstrates respect for our patients. Um, probably post-COVID, this is even more um, significant. So what we try to do is avoid those words on the left and use the ones on the right side instead of using um, the word addict, but it's a person with an opiate use disorder. Same, at, we don't say the word alcoholic, we say a, a person with alcohol use disorder. Babies can't be addicted since we know that to be addicted or to have an addiction um, that you'd have to um, be doing things that you know are wrong and have consequences, et cetera. And obviously that's insane. A baby can't do that. Um, so it's a baby born with neonatal abstinence syndrome. Um, they don't have a problem. They have a disease. Um, there's no such thing as clean and dirty. We don't say if someone has glucose in their urine that they have a dirty urine. Um, they have a negative or positive, or positive drug test. Um, we're not substituting something for another. This is a prescribed medication with specific goals in mind. It's an opiate agonist treatment. Um, even the word relapse has negative connotations, even though that we know that many people may return to use, but that may be expected if you know the biolog biological disease and the neuropathology of addiction. That's another talk I could give you um, that it's not going to happen overnight. I don't care what you do. It certainly doesn't happen from 30 days locking you up. Uh, you'll just go out and die. There are many attempts at treatments. They're not failures. And people can be, I hate the word recovery, but we use it a lot because you really always have an issue of some kind. You have a problem, you have a disease or whatever, but it's hard to find a word that fits in here. Um, so um, people are, can be in treatment or, or we say people are in recovery. If people ever say to you, um, if you ask them about their alcohol use and you say, um, gee, why don't you, and they say, I don't drink. Um, the next question should be, why don't you drink? Okay, is there a reason why you don't drink? If they um, have a, an alcohol use disorder, that's important because it's important when you go ahead and prescribe medications that are also on those receptor sites. Um, and it should just be part of the history. So the patient barriers that we found are vast. Um, they can't obtain these life-saving med. They, their inability to obtain these life-saving medications at this ED touch point. And the touch points were written by another article by La Rochelle, which just said at every healthcare setting that someone puts their cells in and touch something, then that's an opportunity for people to get treated. And we know that those are barriers and filling prescriptions are difficult. Um, we know that there's some prior authorization. People may need to have an, a... Um, uh, a license or some type of um, government issued picture ID. As we know, many people don't have that and that's expensive and they may not have that. And we're dealing with a huge vulnerable population. This is even much, much, much worse since COVID than prior to COVID. Um, we're seeing, I mean, huge amounts, 50, 60% of our patients with substance use disorder who have unstable housing on our underinsured. So when we translate this into practice, um, we want to initiate treatments and direct, how do we start? So I wanna spend some time, because I understand that you are in the beginning phases of this, if, if that, um, of how to do it. So please interrupt me if you have a question, because I can't see the chat, but um, how do I start it in the ED? Well, the first thing is to have an integrated pathway. The other thing is don't worry about having this huge protocol because that's the death of anything. One doctor can do this. One doctor can get wavered and one doctor can just start working on it. Um, I did that myself before anybody even knew what I was doing and you can do it. And then others will see and others will carry on. And people get stuck on having to have this huge protocol. 
also get stuck on the fact of who's going to identify these patients and they get stuck on the word screening. I hate the word screening, to be honest, because it implies that I have to do something. And when you do it in an emergency department, these screening tools don't really work. How many times do you go into the trauma room and you hear somebody ask a patient, you don't drink, do you? You don't use drugs, do you? Um, a triage nurse will say, do you, um, do you feel safe at home? What does that mean if I'm safe at home? No, my dog died last month. I don't really feel that safe or I don't really have, I just moved or I don't have the money to have an a, um, alarm system. I don't really feel that safe in my house. Like, what do you mean am I safe in my house? So I don't like people to get hung up on this. The important part is that most people are right in front of your face. They're in there even about a third of patients that we see are coming in just asking you for treatment. They may say to you, I want rehab. They don't really mean that they want rehab or they don't know enough to say that you need to talk to them because rehab is not gonna help these patients. Rehab is only going to kill them unless rehab is associated with medications, in which case that can be fine because I can lock someone up for 30 days and make them non-physically dependent, but I can't change their brain wires. When they go out and they see a, a drug, they go back to their environment, they will use. We know that. It's almost expected they will use and they will die because now they aren't even um, tolerant to the medication. So they'll either come in saying to you, I'm here for some reason, um, I want rehab or I'm, I have to get off of these. They will either screen positive because you have something in that someone says, or they're a complication that's easily readily seen. They're in withdrawal, they've overdosed, they're, they have an infection, a soft tissue infection, et cetera. Or you're talking to the patient just part of the visit and this has happened to me. I saw a, a middle-aged woman who had fainted after um, church and uh, syncopized and I saw her and, and this was the issue which no one would have assessed that she was actually withdrawing. Um, and then once we do that, we'll go through these. There's very simple things. You have to make sure they have an opiate use disorder because everything that comes into you, actually 20% of overdoses don't have opiate use disorder. They could have just used a medication, thought that they were doing something and using something else but um, they don't have an obese disorder. So you don't want to start people on an opioid if you, they don't. You want to make sure that you know their level of withdrawal. And you want to absolutely be sure that for um, anyone childbearing age of women that you do a pregnancy testing. And the reason is that most of these individuals will not know they're pregnant and they need to either decide what they want to do with the pregnancy. Um, and most importantly, these individuals who are pregnant will get into treatment almost every state has um, the ability to get pregnant women in treatment. They kind of jump in front of the line so that you have more options for them. Um, and if they don't want treatment, you need to know how to try to motivate them to get treatment. And you're, that's a couple of minute discussion. You're not trying to make them, you're just trying to motivate them and tell them the science around it. And if they don't want to do it right then, then they have an opportunity to come back. But most people that I speak with will try it. They will try it for a week. Like I said, just try it for a week. See if you like it. If you don't like it, you stop. No one's telling you you have to do anything. And when you then interview these patients, they can't believe how much better they feel. They just have never felt normal for their life of their use. And it takes you a week to get to do that. It's not going to happen by your one dose in the ED. And that's what you need to know. That's why you need to give them longer scripts. And then we refer, refer them. So first of all, formally assessing them, you need to make sure that they meet DSM criteria. There are questions associated with this. You don't generally have to go through this. I think once in my life, I went through this because I was unclear. Someone was taking um, a prescription medication not, that wasn't prescribed for them. I wasn't quite sure and I went through the list, but most of the time you'll just see they're using more and more and more. Their desire to, they have a, desires or been unsuccessful efforts to quit. A great amount of time is invested in, in their drug use, their craving. They're doing this no matter what. It doesn't matter what's going on in their lives, what problems they have. Um, they're going to do it no matter what. They've given up almost all other activities and they're, you know, they're buying it illegally off the street. Um, and this is even true of people who were once prescribed opioids, who then like after a surgery or something that really gets stuck and just moves into the disease state. Um, 
you can ask them these questions and some, and you'll be able to see the difference because they might've started with a prescription. Everyone who's on an opiate has tolerance and withdrawal. So these amongst themselves are not um, uh, indicative that someone has an opiate use disorder. If you have cancer pain um, and you built up a tolerance, you will withdraw when I, when I take you off it. Um, and that doesn't mean that you have an addiction or right, that an opiate use disorder, you need to have it in combined with these others as well. Um, so that's really important to note. Um, and then the presence of these symptoms, um, two or three are mild, four or five are moderate and, and greater than or equal to six are severe. We like to start people on moderate to severe um, on opiate use disorder. Um, there's a lot of discussion around pediatric patients, by the way, um, buprenorphine is prescribed, is, um, FDA approved for patients who are 16 and older. We do use it on patients who are younger with our adolescent addiction medicine people. And there, you know, there's a lot of discussion about how much do you have to use, how many months do you have to be using before um, you want to start someone. All I can tell you is that when patients leave, I don't care if they're 16 or 15 and they're injecting fentanyl, which they all are because that's all around, one use when you leave, they'll be dead. So it's better to start and then have somebody um, wean them off and do other services than it is not to start. Um, you need to know whether the person has um, opiate withdrawal to start the medication. You want people to be in, in pretty significant withdrawal before you start. Um, and that's pretty easy if they aren't, if, you're, if you have an X waiver, you can give them home induction or I'd like to say unobserved abduction since many people don't have a home. Um, and that's fine too. Um, there is a scale, this is a scale we use. Quite truthfully, we're kind of investigating whether we can just ask people on a scale of one to 10, how do you feel? Um, and that's probably just as good as this because it is a lot of subjective and a lot of objective data, some objective data. So obviously their part rate is objective. Um, restlessness, you will be able to see them moving around, but and you'll be able to see them yawning and you're able to see their pupil sizes that are getting more and more dilated or their runny nose. But quite truthfully, you can't, that you have to ask them about bone or joint pain. You have to ask them about GI upset. It's difficult to assess this sometimes um, real, real um, scientifically. And I've seen that now in the studies that we're doing. But you can really look at a patient if you understand addiction and if you just ask them on a scale 10 and they didn't think you were trying to kick them out, they would tell you where they were. And it's probably just as good as this, um, as this scale is here. But we, so all we have right now, the thing to know about this is that it cannot be used in infection. So if somebody um, comes in and they have an infection um, they're going to have all the SARS, uh, SARS criteria. You're not going to be able to uh, assess them at all. Their heart rate will be elevated. They can have temp. They can be, you know, look like they're red and sweating, and it will really interfere with um, your ability to use this. Another thing that can happen is the toxidromes of methamphetamine, which are often combined because the toxidrome is exactly the opposite, right? So um, it's it's difficult sometimes with uh, meds, uh, with, with combining medications or drugs. So sometimes it's just a matter of asking the patient, how long has it been since you used? Um, and how do you feel at this point? So you also want to ask them about their willingness um, to, you know, I want to prescribe this and um, I'm going to give you a prescription for it and we're going to walk through it. And what makes people take action is really themselves and engaging in talk and hearing themselves and making a plan together because the people only really listen to one person and that is themselves. Um, so we have this brief negotiation interview or the BNI that we use for everything, whether people are taking their insulin as prescribed, whether they want to go to their next visit, whether they're taking their hypertensive meds, um, whatever. And it's really four components. The first is just raising the subject and making sure you understand when they come in that they are very uncomfortable and you are here to help them. So uh, that's basically it. I'm Dr. Denarfrio. I'm here to help you 
um, do you mind if we talk um, a bit about your drug use? I've never had anyone, even if it's alcohol use, whatever I'm talking to them, who have ever said no. I give them some feedback of what I know, whatever happened, they overdosed or whatever, this is how you came here. Do you, do you remember that? Blah, blah, blah. I make a connection of if they don't make that connection about whether they used to share the needle lately, et cetera, and um, their ED visit. And then I ask them on a scale of one to 10, how ready are they to start treatment? And the reason I do this is just a way of a conversation. If you, you don't have to do this, but it's a conversation. So if they say they're ready or not ready, either of those extremes worry me. But I always said, okay, so you said three or 30% ready to go. Tell me some reasons that are, that are, that are, um, you're ready to, to start. Cause someone will say, I'm not taking that medicine. I don't, uh, that drug, I don't want to do it. You say, okay, so let's talk about this. Tell me where you are. No, no, I'm like a two or a one. And so then you can ask them, well, why did you say a two? Then something happened and they'll tell you, I got kicked out of this. I got this happened to me that happened. There's nothing wrong with asking them, why don't you pick a higher number? But all you're going to do is reinforce the, the reasons not to do something. So it's just a lot quicker. And you can do this in a couple of minutes by just asking them why they didn't pick a lower number. And if they're a zero or one, what would need to happen for you to make that change? What, what would have to happen? And you can understand if I said that, what would have to happen to make that happen? But if I said, no, what would have to happen for you to want to make a change? And that may be, again, that they're kicked out of their living situation. I've had many patients who said their mother, their, their boyfriend or girlfriend said they can't come home um, if they don't use. And so we talk about that. Okay, that'd be a big deal if you couldn't go back to that. Where would you go? Well, I don't know. I don't have anywhere to go. Then I'd be on the street. Okay, there's a reason. Why don't we start today? And then you just summarize it and you get on. I'm telling you, this is a couple of minutes. People will say to you, I'm not going to do it. I'm not ready. Again, you can try and say your advice. My opinion is that this would be really good to start. I see too many people who are dying and the risk of you leaving is quite high of your dying. And they say, okay, thank you. I'm not interested. And you said, okay, here we are. If you want to come back. So then you do the buprenorphine and you initiate the buprenorphine. And I have lots of resources on here that you can share of how to do that. But um, you always need to know when their last use was because you do not want to start people on it that have used, um, uh, just used because you could precipitate withdrawal or worsen their withdrawal. So we don't want people who are on methadone to be more than, we want them to be 72 hours after their last dose at least. Um, so again, those are people I wouldn't start in the ED if they have methadone or if they inadvertently took a methadone, um, they could get unobserved induction, but I wouldn't be doing it there. And then also I would like to know you're probably need to be about 12 hours out for heroin or fentanyl and about a day out for um, things like oxycodone. So if they're in mild to no withdrawal, um, which would be less than eight, which is really not no withdrawal. Um, again, we, we couldn't dose them at that moment you could even keep them in there till they do, but that's a lot of hours for some people and really difficult and more likely what you should do is just have a waiver doctor prescribe them for unobserved induction. If they're greater than eight, they could be anywhere from mild to severe withdrawal and you could start with four if they were lower on that total poll. To be honest, I never start with less than eight, so, but it's there because people do. And um, if you start with four, you can wait for, 30 to 45 minutes, I probably wouldn't do even this much. And then no, if there's no adverse reaction, I would go on to eight. People shouldn't leave there without eight um, if they can tolerate it, because if you use too little buprenorphine, you have tons of receptors still available and people will go out and use. Um, and it's better to just blunt that effect by getting as much bup on those receptors as you can. Um, the um, FDA approves up to 12 milligrams a day for the first day of induction. You'll see that we have often done much more of that, but I would suggest you do that in consultation with someone who is a specialist in addiction before you try that on your own. Um, and then we um, send people home with 16 milligrams for each day until they can get to an appointment and give them extra if you need. 
Um, what I don't want people to do is give a dose and just send them out. That doesn't help. They're going to wake up in the morning and they are going to crave like crazy and they're never going to get to that appointment. So even if you have someplace to send them the next day, um, you need to give them a prescription so that they can get that medicine. They feel more in control and they will have it. And here we give five days out to people um, before they leave. Um, and so they have it in the morning to take so they feel better. They can go sit in line forever or whatever that service you're sending them to. If you try to send someone that you dosed a morning before to someplace the next day and they have to sit there for three hours and do this long intake, I bet you that only one in 20 will do that. So um, we know we can do it if they feel better and they're willing to sit there. So that's what the responsibility is to give people scripts for several days and then hopefully they can get into treatment. With COVID, we've been giving routinely five or seven days, depending on your area, wherever people can get it to. These are our home induction or really I should change it so it just says unobserved induction now because of there's so many people with unstable housing. But what we do is we just tell them at home to start taking it when they feel really bad. When they feel really bad, I tell them to wait another hour. Be careful that they're in pretty um, moderate withdrawal and then they can start taking a dose. We do it kind of slowly since we're not with them. Four milligrams, they can take some more if they need to. And if they're still uncomfortable, they can take some more. Um, and then in the second day, they can take uh, 16 milligrams. We have them take it all at once because it's easier and it's less pill and things to have to think about. Um, the only time we suggest is if you're using it for pain, um, the analgesic effects of it are much less um, than the withdrawal effects. So are much shorter. So we may separate their dosing out if they've also had an injury. But other than that, taking it once a day is fine. And it doesn't make them obsessed over their medicine. Um, we also want to make sure that we educate them about overdose. So you know, prior non-fatal overdose, these are the risks of dying. Um, leaving a controlled setting, so incarceration or a residential treatment without medications, these are when people die. We've seen that. There's a zillion studies out to prove that. Um, when you're using large doses of, um, and really that's even been shown to be over 50 milligrams of morphine equivalents. Taking co-prescribed or co-use of opiates and benzos and alcohol actually too. Um, it's not that people and, and people with, <laughs> with obese disorder use many drugs with substance use disorder. Um, it's un, pretty unusual if you've got somebody to just use one um, drug. So they're gonna use this and it's nowhere near to stop them just because they might have uh, benzos in their urine or tell you that's no reason not to give um, buprenorphine. It's just a discussion with them is that these two things to get two together at high doses are not great so that they should really monitor their use of that. Obviously injecting um, and snorting actually can do it just as much. And the high potency um, opioids and the um, other analogs um, and sleep apnea or COPD and low levels of physical tolerance and new issues can really um, cause a risk for overdose. So we have them carry their naloxone and people say to me, why are you giving me this? I'm the person who just overdosed and I go, because keep it on you. Your friends might know that you have it. You can tell your friends you have it. One of you needs to have it with you at all times so that someone can administer it. Um, and then finally provide them a referral for ongoing agonist treatment. And this is just an example of one. And we personally don't fill it out all of it all the time, to be honest with you. But this is a referral form that we use for everybody. Um, now with our EHR system, we can send a request right through the HR to some of our centers. Others we have to fax this to, but that's something that you would have to tailor to your site. We just really want to tell this, wherever this place is, you're sending patients that you've, you've um, started this individual on um, buprenorphine, how much you've given them. And really, um, you always want to make sure that the patient's contact numbers are correct. You're not just taking them right off of your HR, but in fact, that is their cell phone number because they generally change their cell phone numbers quite a bit. 
Um, and so how could they get in touch with them if they're going to make an appointment if you can't give them a direct appointment? Hopefully you will give them a direct appointment and you'll say you can go Wednesday. And I'm always really careful in saying you're, they're fitting you in. Remember, this is a fit in. They're going to be seen Wednesday morning, sometime between nine and 12. I can't tell you that, you know, but if you don't show up there a decent time, they're not going um, to see you. So you need to, you know, just sit for a bit and know they will see you if you show up because they've agreed to see it. And then many referral sites are finding more and more that they're more, much more readily working with patients because patients with obese disorder, you know, their days are a little mixed up. They might show up on a Thursday when they're supposed to show up on a Wednesday. And they generally do fit people in pretty quickly because all you need to do is assess how they're doing and give them another script. You can always go back and do all this other type of assessment at a later date. Um, these are some websites and I will give these to Sophia so you can have any of this. This is basically um, the uh, NIDA's website that we put a lot of this information on. Um, it also has a lot of videos that you can watch. These videos are really, really quick um, videos about how to initiate conversations. They're all done by our providers. Um, the patients are actors but the doctors and um, counselors are all are real. And the only one that's long is the adolescent because it's really much more difficult to um, speak and um, with an adolescent and make sure that they are safe. So um, what more do you need to know or we need to know is um, I think we should be a little bit more explicit here in step two. So these are all the things that you have to think about. Um, you have to engage some multidisciplinary teams together to help you. You need to find those local champions. Um, and I found in those four sites, the minute the chair just said, you're doing it, then things all happened and it just got done. But that took a little bit of time before the emphasis came in. In this institution, you cannot work here as a physician, an emergency physician, unless you are waivered. So it's just a requirement. You get it, you do it. We make sure it happens easily for you. We, um, we don't pay you to do it. It's just part of your expectation, which reminds me that um, ASAP will be coming out, annals will be coming out. It's just totally proved it's about to get uploaded that we do have a consensus recommendations for treatment of, of um, OUD that went from a lot of consensus group and ASAP will be saying that is recommended that you um, initiate ED buprenorphine and that you are trained. Uh, so that will come out. So you won't have much to like to stand on if you don't know how to do this. Um, we suggest that you get your CQI groups to monitor feedback um, and see uh, patients who come in, have they been offered it? Patient doesn't have to take it. You just need to say in your chart, I offered the buprenorphine. They were not ready to take it. They have an option where to go should they become ready to take it. And that's the end of it and anticipate any barriers and find solutions. Um, lots of pharmacists are great at this. So if you're new at it, um, you can get your pharmacist to help out. I can tell you that once trained, almost everyone who does this needs some help. I'm always available. Everyone is available. I think people off the country have called me. Um, people from my state call me all the time. I was on vacation last weekend, trying to be on vacation last weekend and someone called me at Saturday night. My phone is there. I talk to them of how to do it. Once I do that, once anyone does that, you feel fine. I don't actually understand why emergency physicians have trouble with this. You open chests, you do lots more things that can hurt someone. You can't hurt anyone with this. Could you make them worsening withdrawal? Yes, it's not a life-threatening thing. It's a, it's a bad thing for the patient. It's difficult to treat. You should treat it with more buprenorphine, but um, it's not life-threatening. So you're not gonna hurt anyone. Um, not that you, you could potentially hurt a lot of people in your jobs, but in this particular situation, it's only an upside here. Um, and we develop protocols and tools and resources to make this really easy. And if you can integrate it into your EHR, it's so much easier. Um, we just have a couple of things I wanna, we're doing some very cool things and this will be published um, shortly, um, hopefully, um, that we are did a retrospective review with Dr. Herring on all of the year 2018. And there were literally um, 
no cases of respiratory depression and only five cases of precipitated withdrawal that had nothing to do with dose. And these were giving people really high doses, anywhere from 12 to 32 milligrams. Um, the median length of stay was low. Um, it had nothing to do with what they were given. And 54 unique providers were um, had used it during the course. So that is more to come with that. And right now we're testing different formulations in a project ED innovation. And um, this is a hybrid one, remember different exact reverse where effectiveness is uh, much more um, emphasized over implementation, but we're trying to compare um, an extended release buprenorphine to a sublingual bup induction in approximately 2000 patients in um, whether they can get to treatment or not and are engaged at seven days. Um, we're also looking at using the injection at very low cal scores and we will be, we just finished the first 75 patients, which is what we wanted. And we were able to do that in patients with cal scores four to seven, um, for sure. We were able to do quite safely. We just don't have enough yet in the lower um, scores where you're really not withdrawing at all. And we're looking at surveillance types of how to look at phenotyping. So your EHR can spit up the numbers for you. So CAM is a 2038, is not approved yet. It's uh, marketed by Brayburn. However, it probably will be by the middle of this year. So you will know of it. It is an injection. It's pretty easy to give. The only thing you need to know is that you don't give the first injection in the arm because it causes more reactions. Mostly we give it in that uh, supragluteal area. It's a lot like Lovenox, so the nurses are not, uh, and we've been using it a lot for under IND, um, are easy to give and they haven't had any questions about it. And what you can see on this right hand, oops, on the right hand side is um, the pharmacokinetics. So what happens with sublingual nitro is it very rapidly gets into the bloodstream and then it really rapidly dissipates and it gradually goes away over a period of time. So that's the kind of spikes that happen with sublingual. If you give CAM, it actually is slow, but not really slow. It kind of reaches that um, two nanograms per milliliter where sublingual is in about four hours. So it's people who got it may need a little bit of rescue dosing in here, but it, then it um, is pretty consistent and lasts for um, approximately seven days. So it's really nice for patients who um, you're afraid they're not going to get their, their prescription filled for a lot of different barriers. There are people with unstable housing, so I can get them somewhere in um, a week. I can tell you from our focus groups of the patients who received CAM, they love it. They have said they have never felt better um, and more normal after um, having this steady state. Um, so it can be good. There are some issues with it and hopefully we will have a paper out that talks about our experiences so people will get to understand it before it's available. The ED innovation is taking place in multiple sites. As you can see here, we have over 30 sites throughout the country. Um, we've enrolled 285 patients to date in these 27 sites. Um, some of them have two locations. And then the ancillary, we've enrolled 75, which is at the low um, to no withdrawal. And that's complete for now. The DSMB is looking at that data to see whether we can then incorporate that to the RCT. So in general, we know the extent of the problem. We know that treatment works. We know that the ED offers this credible option to combat the crisis. We know that the consequences of an action is that people will die. We know the evidence and we learned how to break down barriers and increases the chances of success. And we are investigating these different strategies of dosing and formulation and surveillance techniques that will make it maybe a little bit easier in the future. And um, it's a life facing disease. Sorry, treatment works. So save a life. We initially observed them after a, an overdose or a problem and sent them home. But well, we now we can initiate treatment with buprenorphine. We can give them harm reduction strategies. Um, we can facilitate the referral and we can keep alive besides just saving it. And therefore these individuals can get alive. 
So at the end of the day, ED buprenorphine is not optional. And none of us will rest till we see this in every ED. This is from California Bridge, and you can always look that up. It's a great program. It's all over California. Tons of hospitals are involved. Andrew Heron runs this project that's funded a lot by SAMHSA. And this is what sits in the front of his ED in Highland. Um, you need help with pain pills or heroin. We want to help you get off opiates and start you on buprenorphine. Ask here for more information. So um, here are our websites, um, and I thank you for listening, and um, I'll try to get out of this. Oops. For a few minutes, if I can read some of this. Um, so for, I'll start for the minute. The Biden administration did cancel it. Um, it was actually because the way it was done by the Trump administration was illegal. It was just put out there. And actually, um, all of these things have to be done through Congress. And Congress was the one who needed to um, say that they were going to take it away. It had to be a congressional issue. And, on, and it has been in front of Congress right now. It's in both. There are supporters in both the Senate and in, um, in the um House of Representatives to move this forward. So it has to go through there. Unfortunately, and um, there are many organizations who are against this. So ASEP has come out very, very strong for this, but there are other organizations, um, many of which um, I work with, SAMHSA, for example, or um, ASAM are not have not come out in the support of it. It's sort of like the Heart Association. If you said we don't need to do ACLS, and you can imagine the mess that might create because a lot of people have whole financial things that happen because they do this, right? So in emergency medicine, you only have to take it once. You never have to do it again, but all these other people have to keep doing it. It becomes a life of itself. And so we need to understand, we, we can't stop the stigma. Why is it that we need to do this? And you can give out thousands and thousands of different doses of other opioids without special training. Why is it that you can do everything that you do and don't have to have an additional eight hours of training. I'm not saying the training is important. Believe me, it's a, I, I need to know you know how to do this, but I could give you a one hour talk. You can read about it. You can you can call someone up. Like if you call the consult up and say, oh my goodness, how do I do this? Or I'm, I got myself in trouble. Um, how can I fix this? Um, and you could do that. You do not need to be required to do it. Although I hopefully it's all in, at Yale, for example, all of our medical students are waivered, have done the training to get waivered. You have to have a, um, a license, your own license, DEA license to get finally waivered, but all their training is done with the PAs, with the nurses, students, with our medical students, our residents. Everyone gets waivered before they leave. Hopefully everybody's doing that so we can just get it done in medical school eventually and then no one has to worry about anything because they will have gotten the training. Doesn't mean that you actually know how to do it, Right after after the waiver, you won't know how to do it either. The training, um, although ASAP has led us, um, SAMHSA has led us do do a ASAP sponsored training, and it's done by us. We've written it, and it's much better than the general one. It's we still had to meet all the guidelines that they wanted us to, so it's a little boring. We had to do the slides similar to ACLS. Um, so anyway, it is up in Congress again, and we are hoping. Um, Many of us have written um, articles and um, stuff about it, but there's equal amount of people who somehow think it's special um, that we have to negate. Um, so most of the other things were just in relation to the X waiver. Um, is there any, just wanna uh, have given an opportunity to anybody in person. Does anyone have any questions or comments? Okay. I, I was, I, I was just going to say, I, I took the ASAP uh, X waiver course and it was excellent. And I think very EM uh, centric and uh, was, was a great opportunity to uh, take it virtually. So if anyone's interested, it's, it's really good. So great. Are you all um, starting this? Are you, what, what do you need to get this going in your institution? I think there's a group of uh, faculty who, who are becoming X waivered and uh, starting the practice in the 
in the ED, and uh, we're, I think a big part, I'm, I'm, my name is Jim Rose, I'm the resident leader right there. Uh, and a big part of it too is we want to provide that training and education for the residents that kind of starting to disseminate it from that, that viewpoint. That would be great. That would be wonderful. Um, I think we will be doing another course, um, I think it's in June from SAM. Um, and they're all, these are all free and ASAP offers them like every two months or so every month. So they're all free of charge. So maybe you can just join one of those. Um, that's everyone can join. And then after that, it's a big pain in the neck because you have to take the four hours. You then have to go on and we have to approve that you've done it. Then you have to get on and do the um, computer part. Truthfully, it's two hours. It's not four hours. You can get through that pretty quickly. We do all the major stuff in the first four hours. And then you have to apply to, uh, then you get a certification from SAMHSA, then you have to apply to the DA, and that can take up to uh, four to six weeks, sometimes eight weeks, to get the, that X waiver. And it's just really an X that replaces the first letter of your DA number, and it's an X, whatever the letter, and then your number, and um, then you prescribe. So it's a lot of hoops to go through. It's not just the training, it's having to make sure that you do all that other stuff. So that's why we would like to get rid of it, Obviously, you know that the government has a lot of other things that are happening right now. This is the least of their problems, I guess. Um, so uh, I don't know when it's going to get axed, but I'm hoping that it will be shortly. But we still doesn't take away from the training that you need, but you probably could do that in one of your courses like here. I could, I'm happy to come and train on, you know, specifically about what you need to know about buprenorphine. And most importantly, you need to know how to treat pain and with people who are on buprenorphine, and um, that's another talk. Um, but you'll be seeing lots of people who, who come in that are on bup, and sometimes I just have to say in the trauma room, is there something you need to tell me? Because you're giving out large doses of fentanyl and nothing's going on. And um, you're gonna need to give 10 times the normal dose, but people will stop breathing. So if they're going to the OR, it's better to intubate them early and then give them all the medicine that they need. Um, or you have to watch them like hawks because um, they will still stop breathing before you can get rid of their pain if it's a real open fracture, horrible event. Yeah, I thought um, this was a very great introduction. Hopefully we can kind of motivate everyone to get this in action and talk to our addiction specialist. Um, Dr. Nofra, we're unfortunately done for the day. I just want to make sure some of the residents can get to, to their ship. Would you be able to send the slides? Because I think many of us are going to be interested in reviewing those slides and getting access to the treatment. Absolutely, I'll send them to you. Okay. All right, awesome. Okay. So and they are all, a lot of the slides have different kinds of slide sets for different things. They're all on that website that's on there on the Yale ED thing. You can go through there and the, there's a lot of articles you can download. There's, you can take all of the slide sets and use them any way that you want. I don't really care, okay? <laughs> All right. Thank you again. All right. Take care, everyone.